Okay, this is uh, Psych 291. This is the Introduction to Counseling class, uh, ooh, fall of 2020. Uh, we are doing this online, as curious as that is. Um, I had already, um, my dean had already agreed to allow me to uh, teach this class online before. Uh, so even if COVID hadn't hit, uh, I would still be here in uh, Lost Nation, Iowa. Um, we were going to do it that way anyway. This is Introduction to Counseling. I'm not sure how this is going to work this this semester. We've tried this online before. Didn't uh, to, to uh, and we had some degree of success and some degree of of uh, problems. Um, fall 2020. Uh, we're going to go over the syllabus uh, real quick. I am Dr. Bradway. I am your instructor. Uh, I, I do live in Lost Nation, Iowa. You can look it up on your Google Maps if you want to. It's a tiny little town of about 500 people. Uh, it is south of Maquoketa, and it is uh, east of DeWitt. No, west of DeWitt. It's west of DeWitt. <laughs> uh, if you can find Davenport, Iowa... Or Bettendorf, Iowa. Then we're about 35 miles north of there. Anyway, and we're about 35 miles uh, west of Clinton, so uh, that's Lost Nation. Not much of a town. As a matter of fact, doesn't have a grocery store. It's kind of like Say Lee. All it has is a, is a has, all it has is a gas station. So it's kind of like Say Lee, but with more people, and everybody's white here. So that's. Kind of different. This is my cell phone. It's actually my cell phone. Um, I'm having trouble with my cell phone. The battery keeps dying, so I'll try to keep it plugged in. Try to figure this out. Um, I do not receive text messages. My phone doesn't, for some reason, it, it won't receive text messages. And of course, that irritates my daughter to no end because. Um, she says if you're if you're going to communicate with modern students, then you need to be able to get text messages. And evidently, I'm irritating my daughter. Um, my office hours, I'm going to have them uh, by Zoom. I will send you the number for the meeting number. You don't have to contact me if you don't want to, of course. I'm going to try to do it at two different times uh, during the day. Uh, on Monday, I'm going to do it eight eight ten in the morning, eight to ten. Uh, your time, this is Mountain Time. Uh, that's, of course, 9 to 11 here. It's 7 to 9 in uh, if you live off the reservation in Arizona. Uh, Tuesday, 4 to 6 uh, p.m. It's 4 to 6 in the afternoon. Uh, or 3, three uh, it's uh, 5 to 7 here. It is uh, five, seven, uh, 3 to 5. Yeah, three to five if you live off the reservation. Anyway, we're doing, I'm spreading it all around. So hopefully, no matter where you, you are or, or, or when you work, maybe you can get a hold of me if you need to get a hold of me. Uh, if you don't need to talk to me, then then you don't need to you can just Zoom and we can figure out what's going on. I have to warn you, um, it's summertime here. And in the summertime, I wear shirts without sleeves. So don't get offended. Please don't get offended. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll, try, I'll try to comb my hair. <laughs> uh, that's fun. Okay. Anyway, there's my email. The best way to, to contact me is probably by email, and then I'll answer your questions or whatever. Uh, if you need to talk to me, then, then I'm certainly available four days a week. Uh, if we need to, to set up another appointment, I have no problem with that at all. You're more important than j just about anything except my grandson. Uh, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's the most important thing in the world. And you guys are at least number two, maybe number three. Uh, I guess I'd better, my wife's not here, but if she were here, I'd better say that she's number two. So you guys are at least number three. Uh, this is uh, Introduction to Counseling. As I said before, I'm not exactly sure how we're going to do it. This is a textbook. I didn't select this textbook. Uh, it was being used uh, when I first got here. Uh, but it's really kind of fascinating because 
Uh, this is a textbook out of Indiana University. Uh, I am from Indiana, um, and I have been, I've taught out of a similar textbook uh, when I was teaching uh, uh, family services up in uh, up in Montana. Um, so I was te actually teaching social work classes, uh, and we used exactly the same textbook. So if you are are taking this class and, and want to transfer to uh, to social work. Uh, you're going to get the same stuff from me that you're going to get from uh, uh, a counseling class in social work, as weird as that sounds. Uh, it's a good textbook. Uh, it's the uh, technique that I, I learned uh, when I was going through uh, counseling. Uh, I went through counseling in a um, extension class, a, extension course with the uh, University of Northern Colorado. And the individuals that taught us uh, counseling were from the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater. Uh, they came down and uh, they were the ones that, I was in Lubbock, Texas at the time. Anyway, uh, I learned the same tech, this same technique, uh, that it's called Egan's Model, Rogerian Therapy using Egan's Model is what it's called. Um, we're gonna try to cover the whole book. It's not very big. I hope it wasn't very expensive. We're going to try to cover the whole book, and then one of the things we're going to do is we're going to be counseling one another. Uh, so we're going to get through the, the, the book in about 10 weeks, and then the last five weeks will be spent uh, with you guys counseling one another. Uh, now, what does that mean? Does that mean that I think you're all nuts? And the answer is no. My goodness, no. Uh, what we need to do is we need to practice. We need to practice talking to each other. Uh, not the easiest thing in the world, especially somebody that you don't know. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to create fictional characters, uh, and we are going to act out that fictional character's problems uh, with each other. Uh, now there are uh, thing the, the uh, uh, parameters uh, as far as selecting a problem that your that uh, your character will have. Uh, you can never have had this problem. You cannot have have this problem now, or have had this problem in the past. Uh, so, if you suffer, you suffered from depression uh, five years ago, or you suffer from uh, depression currently, then that cannot be the problem that your that your client has. Uh, if you try to use a problem that you've had in the past, uh, then one of the things that will happen is that you will you might potentially have a relapse and we don't want to deal with that uh, you could potentially sue me and you could potentially sue the school and that's not what we want uh, we just want you to practice uh, on on one another uh, so you need to create a fictional biography and i i will i will put the uh, the form up that you need to fill out uh, i'm going to give you points just to do it uh, just to fill the, the thing out um, there will be discussion questions with each chapter. There will be quizzes with each chapter. Uh, fictional biography. You, you need to do 10 counseling sessions with your fellow uh, students. Um, <clears throat> in the past, I have had to create a character of my own uh, and, uh, and participate in, in some of the counseling sessions as the client. Uh, but I won't have to do that because you guys are going to be interacting with each other. Um, okay, what's going to happen on the on the reservation in the future? Well, potentially uh, the face-to-face -face counseling is, is going to be relatively rare. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're going to be using uh, virtual virtual counseling sessions potentially in this in the future, it's going to be on Zoom or it's going to be on uh, Duo or it's going to be on Skype. Uh, I can't think of any of the other systems. Uh, I'm a dinosaur. I'm 70 years old, so all of this stuff is new to me. I can't even get text messages on my telephone. You guys can potentially do a counseling session on the telephone. You know, this is really kind of weird to me. We have, I have a colleague, uh, Jeremiah Barber. Um, he has a difficult time making contact from his house. So what he does is that he will drive to some place high, <laughs> and he will. And when we have a Zoom meeting, uh, there's old Jeremy, uh, Jeremiah. I'm sorry, Jeremiah in his car, um, uh, participating uh, in a Zoom conference. 
from his telephone in his car. So potentially we can do the same thing. You guys, you guys know about this stuff a lot more than I do. Uh, I'm like I keep saying, I'm a dinosaur. I can't even get text messages on my phone. So you, you guys can figure this out better than I can. Uh, now it's possible that that uh, you can pretend that oh, I don't want to do this, so you become passive aggressive with this, uh, you know. And passive aggressive behavior is a form of mental illness, so we certainly don't want that to happen. Uh, you need to do ten counseling sessions. Uh, I would prefer that you didn't do them with your buddies, uh, that you did them with with somebody uh, that you don't know. Um, I understand. Uh, I've been working at uh, Dene College for ten for five years. <laughs> I almost said ten years. I've been uh, I've been uh, working with uh, the indigenous populations in the United States for fifteen, sixteen years. Sixteen years. Uh, I was teaching up on uh, the Fort Belknap Reservation before I was here. I've taught at uh, Salish Kootenai uh, with the Salish and Kootenai. Up in uh, up in uh, western Montana, uh, Fort Belknap is in the middle of the state, up near the top, north north central uh, Montana. Um, so I understand passive aggressive behavior, but I also understand you guys are are Generation Z or something, Generation X. I don't know what you are. Anyway, you're a generation that no, understands these things better than I do. Uh, so zoom it, uh, duo it, uh, Skype it, figure it out. Uh, you can do it because potentially in the future, this is the type of counselor you're going to be. You're going to be a counselor who contacts people on the telephone rather because of COVID-19, because of the vast different distances uh, that people are away from uh, their counselors. This may be the, the wave of the future. Uh, and this may be the only way that we are able to help each other. Uh, mental illness is exploding all over the United States. Uh, people don't like to be isolated. They don't like to shelter in place. All of this is making people angry. Uh, we're getting uh, individuals with anger issues uh, are picking up guns and, and walking around. Uh, lots of shootings uh, in, the, in the big cities. Um, I don't know. This is good. This may be the, the wave of the future. So this is what we're going to do. You need to figure it out. Uh, I will continue to work on it. Uh, potentially, if you uh, this isn't working for you, uh, then we will figure something else out. But let's let's give it a shot. Uh, this this is uh, something uh, new, and it's something potentially something that might be good for the the people on the reservation. Since people in, in uh, uh, Tuba City um, have a difficult time communicating with people in Crown Point, you know, this, is, this may be it. This may be what, what needs to happen in the future. Anyway, so the fictional biography, you need 10 counseling sessions. It adds up to 500 points, and that's how you pass the class. There's also a five-page library paper. Now, the library paper will be on the problem that your client has, that your character has. So if your character is suffering from alcoholism, then what you need to do is write a paper on alcoholism so that you can learn about what people who are alcoholic, uh, what, what they suffer from, how they, how they react to things. Uh, you, it can be, it can be um, a uh, question about your sexuality. It can be a question about your gender, uh, you don't feel like a male and you don't feel like a female. You know, I, I'm, I'm not saying that anybody has. <laughs> These problems are prevalent all over the United States, and I have seen them uh, on the uh, Fort Belknap Reser Fort Belknap Reservation. I've seen them on the Navajo Reservation in the Navajo Nation. There are people with uh, gender issues, so uh, you know those are those are problems that you can potentially. Uh, have for your your character uh, and these are something these are issues that people might need to talk about and they may be issues that are hidden uh, that nobody wants to talk about uh, I was in a meeting the other day and, and uh, Professor Barber was talking about uh, how this this is a, a, a problem that uh, he has seen 
and that he thinks needs to be dealt with. And then we had uh, somebody that uh, was in the meeting who was a traditionalist, and he said, well, if that's the problem, then they need this ceremony. And he said, not everybody uh, has that kind of money. Not everybody is, is that traditional uh, that, they would, uh, that they would do that. Uh, we, we need to be able to talk about this and, and deal with these issues. So no matter how traditional you are, no matter how you feel about this, if you're going to become a psychologist, you're going to have to figure out how to deal with this kind of, uh, these kinds of problems. So, you know, that, that could be a, uh, an issue. Uh, the first uh, time I did this, that, that, that I taught this class in uh, the first year I was here, um, we had a student, and that, that was his character's uh, issue, was that he was transitioning. Uh, that uh, he was a male and he was transitioning uh, to a, a, a female and uh, he wanted to talk he needed to talk about it he didn't actually have that problem of course but uh, I, he was pretty brave and 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 just creating that character and of course it uh, it 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 helped all the people that were in that class uh, because suddenly they thought about it oh this is taboo I can't I can't deal with this. Well, the reality is if you're going to be a psychologist, you're going to have to deal with whatever the problem is that your client has, whether it's taboo or not. Sorry. And if you if you can't, and we're going to talk about this today, if you can't do, deal with that, then you may be in the wrong field. Maybe you need to go into something other than psychology. I mean, we would all like to only deal with the problems that we want to deal with, but the reality is our clients will have problems that are beyond uh, our desires. Uh, yeah. Anyway, and we can we can talk about that all day long. Anyway, so you need to write a paper, and your paper has to be about uh, your character's uh, mental illness or or whatever problem they potentially have. And we're wandering through. We're wandering through. This has to do with discussions. Uh, the discussion questions, uh, there are 10 discussion questions. Uh, they deal with uh, the chapters that we are covering that week. Uh, all right, and we are finished with this. And okay, the counseling sessions. Um, the reality is we all have our own voice. Uh, we all have our own strengths uh, and potentially we have our own weaknesses of course, but uh, I don't expect you to counsel like I do. Um, I don't, uh, there isn't a right way and a wrong way to do these things. You just need to be able to talk to people and to be able to, to ask the right questions so that you get the right information from them. You're trying to fix, you're trying to help them. You want them to feel better than they felt when they first came in. So when we all, like I said, we all have our own voice. Uh, the quietest person might be the best counselor. The loudest person might be the best counselor. Uh, the individual that uh, uh, dresses uh, strangely may be the best counselor. It really, we, we can all be good counselors and it's mostly listening and not talking is how you become a good counselor. Okay, so we, and I'm going to talk about counseling online. I have a chapter about counseling online. Anyway, there we go. Did I sign it? Oh, I haven't signed this one. Maybe that's the problem. Okay, I have to sign it. Oh, this is, this isn't uh, my PDF. Okay, let's, let's get to today's lecture. Today's lecture is going to be kind of long. I'll try not to, I'll try to get through it. <laughs> Anyway, chapter, I love this picture. <laughs> uh, the man is creating himself. You can't argue with that. There we go. Okay. Anyway, okay, so chapter one is the importance of self-understanding. And, and, and it, it is important. Uh, we, we need to know who we are. And we need to recognize the fact that we may be different from the person that's standing beside us or the person that's behind us in line at the Saley gas station, or wherever we happen to be. Understanding the client's personal beliefs, uh, this will be influenced by different aspects of the client. 
Um, not everybody, and I understand this, we had this argument, well, it wasn't an argument. We had a conversation about this uh, during the meeting that I was just talking about, that uh, people in the people from different areas of the reservation have different ideas and different belief systems. They're not all the same. Uh, the people from the north, uh, northern portion of the uh, reservation don't think the same as the people that live in, in uh, New Mexico, uh, down on the checkerboard, uh, people that live out west. I was talking to a, a student uh, when I first arrived here, and he said, I don't understand this Hogan stuff. Uh, where I come from, out west, out by the the uh, uh, Grand Canyon, uh, we build our hogans out of stone. We build them out of rocks. We don't build them out of wood. You know that's not something that we do. This is this is a totally alien to me. So this whether they're they're uh, they're uh, Diné or not, um, they may not have the same ideas that that uh, that you you have. Uh, wherever you you happen to be from, uh, the people from Kienta seems seem to be really surprised when they come to Sailey because some of the things that they learn from the fifth floor just don't really fit with what they think. Uh, same way with Tuba City. I have a um, well, I don't know how to explain this, but I have a goddaughter that lives in Tuba City. Uh, her father is from Fort Belknap, and and we were good friends up in up in Montana, and I was his uh, daughter's god godfather. I, yeah, she's my goddaughter. Anyway, uh, she's Navajo, of course. Uh, her mother's Navajo, her father's. But of course, <laughs> Diné people are matrilineal, and, and uh, he's Grovan, and Grovans are patrilineal. So, you know, they're, they had this, you know, this whole... Uh, strange system of uh, of uh, where, where she spent her summers and where she spent her her school year. Anyway, she met sp she spent most of her school year here in Tuba City, or down in Tuba City. Anyway, um, her she had a different, really tough time at, at Saley because the ideas here were just so different from what she was used to. And not only that, but uh, of course the Hopi reservation is right there. And most of her friends were Hopi because uh, it's kind of odd. To, okay, she was she was uh, not full blooded Navajo, and because of that, some people rejected her. And she looked a little bit different because you know the Grovan don't look the same as as people who are Navajo. Anyway, so she a lot of her friends were Hopi, but I mean they she couldn't be really good friends with the Hopi uh, people because they have different ideas. So you know, you just never know about people. What what is their what is their culture? You need to understand who they are and where they grew up and and how that is different. And if you don't recognize, if you think everybody in the world is the same, you're going to be really surprised uh, the first time you talk to somebody who's Japanese or somebody who's German or somebody who's Italian or you know whatever. Uh, or somebody who is uh, from the Laguna Pueblo. Uh, one of the first uh, uh, native fellows that I met when I was in the service was a guy from Laguna. Nicest guy in the world. His wife was Kiowa. Uh, but anyway, he was just a nice guy. Uh, but, I mean, he he was about as different from, from people on the Navajo Reservation as you can possibly imagine. Really nice, nice guy. Anyway, uh, so you you you've got to deal. You've got to understand who, who they are and accept the fact that their culture is always right. Uh, it doesn't have to be right for you, but it's certainly right for them. The client's race. How strongly do they identify with their racial structure? Uh, if you, I, uh, I I used to teach at Ashford University, which was in Clinton, Iowa. And uh, a lot of our students were from Chicago. Well, a lot of our Chicago students were minority students. They were African American or they were Hispanic. Uh, I had one student who was Hispanic, but he grew up. Uh, he went to school in a in a white school district. So, and I had other students who were, of course, Hispanic, and they and they went to a more Hispanic uh, school districts. 
And of course, the, the difference between the two of them were, was like night and day, uh, because one grew up with, within the, the Hispanic culture, um, primarily the Mexican culture, and the other one, uh, the other guy, was, was, uh, he went to school in this really rich uh, white section of Chicago, and uh, he, you know, he didn't really identify with his, with his racial structure. He didn't see himself as Hispanic. Uh, he didn't see himself as brown. He saw himself as, and he talked like, you know, some other white rich kid from Chicago. <laughs> it was really kind of interesting. And the other Hispanic people uh, rejected him because, because of his accent and because he didn't really, he really didn't identify with Hispanic issues. So you really need to understand who your client is. You can't just look at them and say, oh, you're Navajo, so this is how you act. You know, it's not going to work that way. If there's more than one race represented, which is the most important, um, a good example was my uh, my goddaughter who lives in Tuba City. Uh, you know, she, most of her friends were Hopi. She's half Navajo. She's half Grovant. Who did, what does she identify with? Uh, how does she identify herself? And, of course, she felt rejected. That's one of the reasons why her friends were, the, her Hopi friends. Uh, she loved going up to uh, Montana because uh, uh, they are more, they embrace difference uh, a lot better. They don't see people as, oh, you're half this or you're half that. Uh, they just embrace you as, as a native. It was really kind of different. If there's more than one, uh, is the multiracial aspect a factor? And sometimes, you know, this can be a factor, and it was a factor as far as she was concerned, because she, she part of her problem was the fact she was rejected because she was half uh, Grovan and half Navajo. And so there, the full-blooded Navajos didn't always treat her very nice, and she didn't, she didn't appreciate that. But we talked about it, and we got over it. We're doing okay. A counselor needs to recognize their own culture might influence the way that they see and interpret their clients. Of course, this is going on right now with Black Lives Matter. Um, the Black Li one of the reasons that we have to have a, a, uh, uh, a movement in the United States where we emphasize the fact that Black Lives Matter is because Black Lives haven't mattered up to this point. Uh, uh, the police uh, have ideas about... Uh, uh, people who are black, uh, they see them all as criminals, as dangerous. Uh, so uh, it just happened yesterday. A guy in Georgia, a, a state trooper in Georgia, uh, was chasing this guy, and he forced him off the road. It was a black individual. He's a 60-year-old man, and uh, the guy was in his car, and he just shot him in the face and killed him. Uh, and he's been charged with murder, but... Yeah, he didn't stop when you wanted him to stop, but, you know, you don't execute somebody because they they didn't want to stop for you. Uh, but he was black. If he'd been white, would he have shot him? You know, that's, that's, that's a question that you have to ask yourself. Just because you run away from the police, is that a capital offense that the individual needs to be executed for? So you need to understand that your own, your own culture may influence the way that you interpret what's going on with your client. Counselor needs to recognize that their racial background might influence the way that they see others, especially if those others are from another race. Uh, they may see them as different. Oh, this is, you know, they may have a stereotypical idea of how people act. And that's, I mean, it's okay to have ideas about people. But to act on those ideas as if this is always what happens, black people always act this way, Hispanic people always act this way, white people are always greedy, you know, all of those kinds of, of ideas, uh, then as a counselor, you're, you're probably going to treat your, your client poorly. And if you're a policeman and you have an idea that all black, pe all black males are dangerous, and all black males are criminals, then yeah, you would, uh, you would uh, be more likely to pull that trigger. You'd be more likely to strangle somebody to death. It's happened several times in the last three or four months 
that uh, they choked a black man to death trying to hold him down uh, because they put their knee on his neck. And of course, that cuts off your airway. And if you do that for too long a period of time, somebody dies. And that's what happened to George Floyd, of course. And that's why there, are, are, there is all of this uh, uh, racial tension going on. Uh, you, may, you, know, you may have your own ideas about things. But the reality is you have to see everybody as the same. You have to see everybody as equal. You can't maintain stereotypes. Uh, you may think that all Apache, I don't know what, what you may think about Apaches, or you may think that all Pueblo uh, Indians, Zuni, whether they're Zuni or Hopi or Laguna or San Juan or, or whatever, that they're all the same. Well, of course they're not because they all come from different places. Anyway, so different races. You may think that all white people are greedy. Uh, you may think that they all think that they're in charge of everything. Uh, but, you know, you gotta, you gotta face people uh, as they are and find out what their ideas are. That's the idea of counseling. Talking to people and finding out who that other person is, no matter what race or ethnicity they are. A counselor needs to come to groups with their own eth ethnicity and how that influences who they are and how they see others. And this is really important as far as I see uh, uh, individuals who uh, come from the uh, Navajo Nation. Uh, you guys have ideas, uh, really interesting ideas, of who other Native peoples are, Indigenous peoples are. Uh, you have some, I've, I've heard some stories. I, you know, when I was uh, up on Fort Belknap, uh, I had a, a student who had been in the military, and she said, you know, I, I was afraid of white people until I went into the military. And then there were so few of us up there uh, in the military that I had to find somebody to pal around with. And she said, when I opened up my mind, uh, I, I found everybody was my friend. Uh, it didn't matter what race they were, but she was afraid of white people because... She'd always she'd heard these stories about white people and whatnot. She stayed off. She stayed on the reservation as much as possible. She didn't have a driver's license because in Montana you can drive on the reservation, and you don't have to drive, have a driver's license, but uh, you can't drive off the reservation. So she never went anyplace. She just stayed on the reservation. As interesting as that is, and we became good friends despite the fact that I'm not native. Uh, we became we became pretty good friends. So these are things that you need to think about. These are things that you need to concentrate on. Self-understanding is an essential step in understanding your clients. If you understand yourself, then you're more likely to understand them. There are multiple influences on how you see yourself and interpret the world around you. Your culture, your race, and ethnicity are, are important. Uh, it all depends on where you grew up. Uh, how important was this? Uh, was it a was it a, a, a segregated community? Uh, back in the 50s and 60s, practically every place was segregated. You either lived in a black community or a Hispanic community or a white community or a native community, and people rarely intermixed. And if they did, it was an oddity. Uh, your gender and your sexual orientation are influential. Not everybody is is uh, straight. Some people are 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 gay. Uh, some people have no sexual orientation whatsoever. They're uh, whatever, and and uh, maybe they identify themselves. They don't like the idea of male, male just males and females. They want to see themselves as something totally different, and you know, we have to accept that. We have to accept them for for who they think they are. We can't tell them who they are. If they're a, a, an African American and they live on the reservation and they think that they're native, we can't tell them that they have to start acting black. That's not our job. Our job is to find out what their problem is and try to help them with, with whatever their problem is. If they are a biological female, we can't force them to become, to start acting like uh, we think females should act. That's not our job. Our job is to help them with whatever problem they have. Your socioeconomic status, spirituality and religion, life stage, family of origin and disability or ability are influential. Uh, the level of stress demands on your life is important as well. Um, 
as you probably don't know, we had a windstorm up here. We had what they call a derecho or an inland hurricane. We had straight line winds of uh, between 100 and 150 miles per hour. Uh, we had never seen anything like this before. Um, it broke off all of our trees. Uh, we live in a place that has lots and lots of trees and lots and lots of corn and lots and lots of soybeans. Soybeans are okay, but a lot of the corn is laying down on the ground. And unfortunately, it has grown to the extent that it won't stand back up. So a lot, a lot of the farmers lost a lot of their, uh, their harvest. We lost, we had six uh, trees in front of our house. And of those six trees, five of them lost branches. Uh, the pine tree we have, we have two pine trees in the north, in the, uh, to, to our west. And uh, one of the pine trees broke off about 15 feet uh, from the, the base of the trunk. And the next 25, 30 feet is laying up against our, our porch. It broke uh, the, this, the roof on our porch. Uh, I could show you pictures. I have pictures. <laughs> anyway, it's fairly stressful as you can imagine. This happened six days ago. So, yeah, I mean, stress. And not only that, but of course, uh, last week was orientation. Um, and, and people were fairly understanding that, that I had this, this horrible situation. Uh, but, you know, you, you didn't go through it, so you don't know how stressful it is. So I've got probably 20 trees on my property, and 15 of them are, are, are almost completely destroyed. Uh, so we're going to have to have people come in and, and uh, cut limbs out of trees and whatnot. It's pretty ugly. Uh, how many trees do I have that didn't break? One, two, three, four. I can only count four that didn't didn't break out of twenty. So that's fifteen trees. And of course, we've been picking up limbs and whatnot. And these are heavy limbs. When I say trees, I'm talking about trees the size. I'm not talking about pinyon pines. Those things are midget trees. I'm talking about trees that look like. The trees around Saley Lake, those pine trees, but uh, these are most. Some of these are oaks and and willows and maples and whatnot. Oh, I got an elm tree down there. Ah, I got an elm tree that didn't get hurt, but I've got a mulberry tree that it ripped it right out of the ground. The thing's about 150, 200 years old, and here I lost it. It's gone. It is laying on the ground, and somebody's going to have to come and chop it up, you know. And and the base of it is probably four feet across. So, you know, this is huge. This is pretty bad. Uh, we, luckily, we didn't lose in the barn. The roof, the roof almost came off our house. It lifted up, uh, tore off almost all of our shingles, and then it laid it back down right in the same place. So uh, we don't have a, it does leak, but we're hoping it won't rain before they get it fixed. Okay. Uh, influence of cultural race and ethnicity, multicultural competence is a significant predictor of satisfaction in counseling. In other words, if you can accept people of all different races without looking at them and seeing them uh, by some strange stereotype, then uh, you, you won't have any problem in, in counseling. Difficulties may arise from unacknowledged differences in perception, and of course that can be a problem. Uh, wealthy people do not understand us, those, those of us who are not wealthy. Uh, I don't know if you remember the speech where Donald Trump was talking about, he wanted, he wanted everybody to have an ID card so that they could vote. And he said, you have, to, you have to show your ID card to buy groceries, so why shouldn't you show your ID card uh, to vote? And of course, the reality is you don't have to show any kind of identification to buy groceries. <laughs> I don't know what he was talking about. This is a man that doesn't understand how to buy groceries, obviously, or maybe has never bought groceries before. Uh, and he made this blanket statement. I'm not sure where he has to show his ID card to buy groceries. Uh, but the only place I have to show my ID card to, sh to buy groceries is, is uh, on a military base. It is critical to examine beliefs, assumptions, and biases. 
it's very important that you recognize the fact that you're biased. And of course, now with Black Lives Matter and uh, the, the race question coming up in the United States, this is something that, uh, that everybody is dealing with. Uh, am, I, am I racist? And the answer is, in most cases, to some degree, yeah, because I've got these strange biases and assumptions, and I have this odd belief system that sees all African Americans as bad people. So if I were walking down the street and I saw an African American that I didn't know, maybe you don't know any African Americans. Maybe, maybe your, your information about uh, African Americans comes from television or movies, uh, and you don't really know. Uh, if you saw an African American coming towards you, you're in Gallup and this guy's walking toward you, are you going to cross the street? Are you afraid that he's going to rob you or afraid that he's going to, to uh, uh, assault you in, in one way or another? You know, these are biases that, that uh, some people have. Of course, I've lived in black communities, so I don't have those biases. And I've been in the military, and in the military, everybody's your buddy. <laughs> that was my assumption, anyway. It is equally important to uh, understand a culture's uh, influence on your clients. Uh, some people are influenced by their culture, some people not so much. Uh, one of the things I've noticed with people who are studying psychology, uh, most of you are more open-minded than other individuals who are not studying psychology, as weird as that may seem. You've already dealt with this before you started studying psychology. Um, it, and, and it should get interesting. We have a, a new colleague, and uh, she said in a meeting the other day that uh, that Western Western psychology cannot cannot heal uh, indigenous people. That's what she said. And I was thinking, oh, gee, when Christmas, you're teaching, you're going to be <laughs> teaching out of our out of the textbooks, Western textbooks. Uh, this should be interesting to see what happens next. But uh, it's important to understand a person's uh, culture and how it influences them. Uh, how do we learn about other cultures? We read about other races, cultures, and ethnicities. Uh, if you ever take my 350 class, I have my students uh, study another culture. I understand the Navajo culture is very important. Uh, fifth floor thinks it's the only culture to study. But the reality is if you're going to be dealing with people from another culture, you need to understand who they are. So one way of finding out about people is to read a book about another culture. And that's what I have my students do in, uh, in Psych 350, Cultural Psychology. I have them read about another culture and then compare it to their own culture. A lot of people don't ever think about their own culture. So the best way to learn about your culture is to compare it to another culture. Uh, so that's what, I, that's what I want you to do, or that's what you will be doing if you take uh, cultural psychology from me. Uh, you will be reading about another culture. It can be fiction, it can be nonfiction. Uh, one of the things I did before I came, actually I read uh, Tony Hillerman when uh, his books first came out. I know that makes me really, really old, uh, but I've been reading Hillerman for a couple decades now. But I reread all of uh, Tony Hillerman's books uh, just before I, I, uh, I took this job and I came up here. So I had an idea of some of the taboos and whatnot. Uh, and I was a little spooked about some of the taboos. Um, one job that I have had in my life is I worked in a morgue. And I also worked in a cemetery. And you guys have this taboo against death. Uh, so, you know, I needed, I, I needed to find out about that. And, and Hillerman, he doesn't hit the nail on the head every time. But uh, he gives you an idea that this culture, this... Navajo culture is not the same as white culture. I mean, he, he was a uh, newspaper man from uh, Albuquerque and Gallup. Uh, so he had some degree of knowledge. Uh, he, spoke, uh, he spoke Navajo, interestingly. Uh, his daughter's trying to write, uh, trying to continue his works. Uh, so I already knew a lot of the names, uh, a lot of the, the common names, Begay and Sosi and Chi. One of his, his characters is named Chi. The, another one is named Leaphorn, and I haven't seen that name since I've been on the reservation. I've taught a lot of people. <laughs> you know, uh, White horse, black horse, uh, what are they? White thorn. 
I had last, and and maybe some of you have these names. Uh, they they're they're just interesting names as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we saw we saw very uh, descriptive names uh, when I was uh, working up north, especially on the Fort Belknap Reservation. Not so much on the Salish Kootenai Reservation, but uh, Flathead Reservation. It's not Salish Kootenai. Salish Kootenai College on Flathead Reservation in western Montana. Anyway, read about other cultures and ethnicities. This is a good way to find out about them with the understanding that uh, there are potentially there are biases and misunderstandings if it is written by somebody who is not from that culture. Uh, even somebody from that culture will see, potentially will see their culture, uh, well, of course they have to see their culture through their own eyes. It may not be very accurate also. We recognize the strengths and weaknesses of dominant and minority racial groups. Uh, that sounds like white people are strong and, and everybody else is not, uh, but that's not what it means, uh, especially now that we're, we're, we're uh, dealing with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we, we see, it was, it's really kind of interesting. See, I've been, de I've been dealing with this since uh, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, almost since it started. Um, when I went went to college, uh, there were this that was in '67, and uh, there was a movement in the United States called uh, Black is Beautiful movement. Uh, before that, um, there had never been a Miss America who was African American. Uh, you know, they had to have their own uh, beauty contest and whatnot. Uh, they straightened their hair, trying to trying to look white. All kinds of really weird and stupid stuff was going on. In the United States, and then these movements trying to give them self pride, self understanding, uh, happened. Uh, so, you know, this is really important that people people recognize their own resilience and their own strength uh, by developing meaningful relationships with people from various racial and cultural groups. We can gain different perspectives on all people. I was really lucky. Uh, well, it's not luck, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in college, I went to a college with a lot of fraternities. Well, this is in 1967. Most of the fraternities in the United States were segregated. In other words, if you were African American, you couldn't join the fraternity. And uh, when I found out that uh, all the uh, fraternities at my college were lily white, I decided that I would become, and I would stay an independent. I would not. I would uh, move into the dormitory rather than move into a fraternity house. So, because all of the fraternities were segregated, all of the African Americans uh, lived in the dormitories, and uh, I was, it was, it was fantastic because it was almost like we were a, we were a melting pot. We were, uh, we, we talked to each other all the time. Uh, you know, you go into college and you don't really have a whole lot of time to. To just sit and, and jaw, but uh, or rap as we used to say. Uh, but uh, I, if you were in a fraternity, <laughs> the only people you had to talk to were other white people. So I was really kind of lucky, and and my I had a roommate that was black, uh, and that was great. I mean, it's fantastic. I became part of the civil rights movement. Uh, this became very important to me, uh, and that may be one of the reasons why instead of teaching at a lily white uh, college at some place in the United States that I have taught at historically black colleges and universities. I've uh, taught a uh, large percentage of Hispanic at, at institutions with large Hispanic populations and now I'm teaching on the uh, at Diné College and I taught up in Montana at, uh, on, on, at another two other tar tribal colleges. Anyway, uh, it just gave me a different perspective on people. I was able to talk to people who were different than me. And when I looked at them, I didn't see them as different. I saw them as brothers. Or Well, it was an all-male college, so I had to see them all as brothers. Uh, and then when, of course, in the military, they don't allow you to, to have any, or at least you can't show any, any racial discrimination. But it was easy for me because... A lot of my friends were black uh, when I was in college. 
and other people didn't get that experience. Uh, and, I, and I think it's, it's sad that they, they didn't get those experiences. By developing relationships with colleagues and mentors who are willing to discuss cultural and racial issues. Uh, one of my uh, favorite things about being at Diné College is that I have so many friends who are Diné. Uh, especially among my colleagues, uh, Marius Begay, uh, Patrick Blackwater, uh, Jeremiah Barber. Uh, you know, these are all really good friends as far uh, to me. They, uh, you know, I, I love these men uh, like I love my own brothers. Um, and uh, it was, n and I appreciate the fact that they they were willing to embrace me as someone that they didn't reject. Uh, it's easy for I and, and I see it uh, among uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the white instructors at Diné College. A lot of times they're they're scared. They're they and they don't talk to to uh, their students as if their students were the same as them. Uh, and they don't have any native uh, colleagues that they that they can uh, that they can talk to. Uh, so. This is really important to me, and I and I'm very appreciative of these guys because <laughs> they're pretty funny. Uh, there you go. Uh, watching films about other races, uh, and that's that's a way to do it. We're going to talk about some of the films that deal with with different groups. Uh, participating in cultural activities or visiting other countries. Uh, this is. Uh, I think this is a Hindi. What is it? E plus club challenge? The Hindu, yeah, this is a, a Hindu ritual. As you can see, you've got the men in the back doing whatever they're doing, and she's holding something on her head, and uh, I don't know. Anyway, she's dancing. It's, it's a, some kind of a strange dance, or not a strange dance as far as they're concerned, I'm sure. Anyway, participating in these things. So going to powwows if you're well, not on the Navajo reservation, but uh, if you were up north, uh, we powwowed a lot when we were up north. Culture has a strong influence on the roles that many people see as appropriate, proper behavior of children toward parents, level of independence and autonomy of children, patterns of communication between parents and children, family boundaries and responsibilities, expression of emotions. Uh, my wife, uh, my current wife, <laughs> that didn't sound right. Look, we've been married for 41 years, okay? <laughs> uh, anyway, my, my current wife, uh, she grew up differently than I did. Uh, she's from Georgia, and I'm from Indiana. And uh, I grew up on a farm, and she grew up in the city. So she's a city girl, and she's a southerner. And uh, anyway, all of these things are different for her. She, the, the way that they treated their children, uh, their children were seen and not heard. Uh, my mother always said uh, when, when she heard uh, children laughing or, ch or, or playing in a restaurant, she said children, the children's job is to make noise. Uh, the children's job is to, uh, is to express themselves. And of course, she didn't really want us to do that, but she... She let other kid, other people's children do that. Anyway, uh, so all of these things can be different. Uh, my parents always listened to what we had to say. Uh, there was no, there was no barrier between us. But as far as my wife is concerned, or yeah, my wife is concerned. When she was growing up, she used to have to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am to her parents. Uh, we never really did that with our parents. We loved our parents and we respected our parents, but we were able to just talk to them without without any barriers between us. <clears throat> Sorry, I just slapped a, a fly. Cultural values can influence feelings about work. Uh, you know, your culture may embrace work. Um, I, I come from a a town that was uh, Methodist, so it had that uh, Protestant at work ethic. Uh, you work, working is is almost a religious thing, so you get the job done. Uh, people that are not um, Protestant, potentially they're Catholic or whatever, uh, they have a different way of, of viewing 
work as, uh, you know, it's, it's just different. Uh, cultural values can influence feelings about education. Uh, when uh, my, my parents really believed in education, they wanted us to go to college. Uh, my mother started, uh, she could have stayed home and, and, uh, uh, and not work, but she wanted to uh, save money so that we could go to college. There were six of us, and that's a lot of people to, to finance in college. Uh, but my dad's, my grandfather, on my father's side, uh, didn't believe in education. He thought, uh, if you're smart, you're smart, and you don't really need all that book learning in order to do things. So when my dad was in the eighth grade, he told my dad, uh, I don't want you to go to high school, but if you want to go to high school, you're going to have to start paying me room and board. And this is during the Depression, so my poor dad, uh, got a job at a grocery store and he would bring his paycheck home and he would give it to his father every every week. Back then they paid you every week. Um, and um, at one point he fell behind. He uh, they, they laid him off at, at, uh, at the uh, store and he fell behind and he was going to have to drop out of high school. And uh, his uh, brother uh, paid his room and board that week. For that month, I guess uh, they called him back later uh, when the uh, store was more stable. Anyway, so my grandfather didn't believe in education. He uh, he went through the the third grade, and then he dropped out of school to go to work because he already knew everything he needed to know. He could read, he could write, and he could uh, add and subtract, and that was enough for him. He was a heavy equipment operator. Uh, he invented a lot of things. He invented the backhoe, as strange as that may seem. Uh, but, and he invented um, uh, banking cur curves. You know, if you're driving down the road and you're, you, you hit a curve on, on I-80, you notice that it's not level. It's, it's banked. Well, the reason it's banked is because uh, if you're going really fast uh, and, the, and the curve isn't banked, then you'll come... You'll, fly off the, the, uh, the edge because you're going too fast. So they bank the curves, and the more they bank the curves, the faster you can go around that curve. Well, they discovered this, uh, he discovered this, it's called centripetal force. Uh, he discovered this uh, when he was riding in a, in a uh, uh, carriage, and it was go they were going really fast, and they tried to go around, they tried to go around a curve, you know, it was pulled by horses, and the horses were galloping, and they, it threw him off. It threw him uh, out, of the, uh, out of the carriage. And so he figured, and he thought about all these things. Of course, nobody was going, you know, 100 miles an hour. This was before automobiles. So he understood that because he'd been throw, thrown out of a carriage when he was a kid. Anyway, he's, he's one of the first people to, to bank curves. As a matter of fact, um, he owned a company that made a portion of the uh, Indianapolis 500, but and the reason the Indianapolis 500 is so po is so famous is because it was the first track with bank curves, and he was the one that put in the first bank curve. The reason he did it was because he knew that they could go faster, and of course nobody had gone that fast before, so they didn't understand centripetal force and 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 whatnot. They did see trains going off the track because the tracks weren't banked. But he, he uh, had, had done that uh, on s some train uh, uh, curves, and they were able to actually go around the curves faster. Um, that's what, uh, is it Casey Jones? Uh, he goes off a curve. Anyway, well, let's not talk about that anymore. Cultural values can influence feelings about health care. Uh, does it work? You know, I, my colleague said the other day that uh, Western uh, psychology does not, cannot help uh, uh, Diné people. So we'll see how that works anyway. Uh, should be interesting for classes. <laughs> Cultural values can influence feelings about religion. Cultural values can influence feelings about family structure and responsibilities. 
In many Asian societies, adult children are expected to provide shelter and care for their elderly parents. Uh, not so much in non, well, uh, in your culture, this is, is fairly common. Uh, and actually, in my family, uh, my grandfather, who was the one that wanted my dad to quit school, uh, they stayed in my parents' house until they died. Uh, and, and my mom took care of She was a nurse. She took care of them. Uh, so I mean, that was what happened in the old days. If you didn't have money, but I had an aunt uh, who was, as, as she got older and couldn't take care of herself, uh, we put her in a nursing home, and she di actually died in the nursing home from Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, culture. In some cultures, parents and other older family members expect to be involved in decisions concerning marriage and money spent by, the, uh, by adult children. My dad was a banker. Uh, he used to give me financial advice all the time, and of course, that meant that I wasn't supposed to, that I couldn't do that because he had told me that I needed to do that. Well, that's the way my family works, but uh, you know, in your culture, it may be that uh, grandpa gets to decide uh, whether you buy that new pickup truck or not. Um, but uh, in my culture, we make our we make our own decisions, and a lot of times we make a lot of mistakes. I certainly have been married th <laughs> three times, and I certainly didn't ask my parents if I could mar get married any of those, the two times it didn't take. Um, as a matter of fact, they didn't even know I was getting married the third time. Uh, I got married, uh, where was I? I was in Lubbock, Texas. I got married in Lubbock, Texas. I got married in Lubbock, Texas twice. Probably first time was a mistake, second time was okay. Uh, when dealing with newly arrived immigrants, language skills may be sparse and local dialects may not be understood. Uh, the children of new Im immigrants may feel torn between their native culture and the new culture. Uh, one of the things that was happening, now of course they've closed the borders because of COVID-19, uh, but before that of course they had uh, people from South America were coming in, people from Central America were coming in. Well, a lot of these, the individuals that were coming in were indigenous people from Central America, Mosquito Indians, uh, there's uh, Quechua speaking Indians. Well, we had people on the border who could speak Quechua, we had people that could speak Spanish, but we didn't have anybody speaking these, these uh, odd dialects uh, that were down there. So here we were speaking to them, the immigration people were speaking to them in Spanish, and they were saying C, si, C, si, because they understood some of the words. Uh, that's what happened. I don't know if you remember, they took a, a, a little girl away from a father from uh, El Salvador, and uh, she died. And they asked him later, did you agree to let them take your daughter? And they discovered that he didn't really speak Spanish, that he was indigenous, and he spoke a, dial a, 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 a native dialect and that he didn't understand what they were talk they were actually talking about. And he didn't understand that she was dead. And of course, eventually all of this, you know, it, it all hit the fan as, as these things always do, as sad as that is. Often people of different races or cultures uh, have different expectations of the pr uh, practitioner and the counseling process. Uh, so just because uh, it's okay you know, if, 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 if my colleague is right about, uh, about uh, uh, Diné people not being able to be helped by uh, Western uh, cult, by psychology, you know, that's, it, it's going to change everything completely. Here we are, we're teaching you something that can't possibly work. Researchers have discovered that Asian clients value insight and personal growth, uh, but they tend to prefer expert guidance, advice, explicit instructions, structured problem focused suggestions. So one of the things that's going to happen as you are, are talking to your clients, uh, the more that they talk, the better off it is for both of you, normally. But if you're talking to an Asian client, they won't talk hardly at all. Uh, they will tell you what their problem is in very simple terms, and it's your job to tell them how to fix themselves. And they will just sit there and wait for you to tell them. Uh, because it's that's not part of their culture. Their culture tells them that you're the expert and you need to tell them how to fix things. It's it's not like uh, if you're talking to me, uh, I'm going to I'm going to be talking your ear off because I want want you to understand my problem. 
but they don't see it that way. They, they want you to give them advice. When dealing with American Indians, a counselor has to gauge how traditional the individual is as to determine proper, appropriate, and, uh, and timing of eye contact, how directly to come to a point in a conversation, personal space, and facial expressions. Uh, I had a friend up in Montana who did his, uh, he's from New York City, he's a Jewish guy from New York City, and he decided that he was going to study indigenous populations. Uh, what was his, what did he do? He taught American Indian studies. This Jewish guy from New York decided he was going to teach American Indian studies. So he has a PhD in American Indian studies. And he did his PhD research on the Navajo reservation. So here he is, he's this guy, from, <laughs> he's this Jewish guy from New York. And if you, if you've ever been around Jewish people from New York, they, they'll talk your ear off. They, they will, will not allow there to be silence in, in the room. They fill it up with noise. And you may have noticed this sometimes, you know, if you listen to, uh, to the news a lot of times, there will be uh, individuals who are Jewish people from New York. And uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's hard to get a word in edgewise. It's really kind of fascinating. But anyway, he was a good friend of mine, and uh, he, was, uh, he was teaching... <laughs> He was teaching American Indian Studies at uh, the uh, University of uh, Montana Billings, uh, which is kind of funny because just south of there is the Crow Reservation, and here this Jewish guy is teaching American Indian Studies. Anyway, so he so he comes down to the Navajo Reservation, and he's he's talking to this elder, and the elder didn't speak English very well, and uh, he asked him a question. And, of course, he's Jewish, and he's from New York, and so this guy's sitting there, and he's thinking. And uh, finally, uh, uh, Phil said, uh, why is it taking you so long, so long to answer? And uh, the, uh, the uh, Navajo elder said, well, you know, Phil, your questions are so good, and they are, are, are so um, in-depth. Uh, I have to think for a long time to come up with the right answer. And I kind of put him in his place. So after that, he, he wasn't uh, as impatient about uh, listening to the elders. He, he really had, he had been to several different places, and he probably had uh, uh, embarrassed himself and disrespected the individual he was talking to. But anyway, it was really kind of funny. Yeah, the other odd thing was that uh, the, there was a university just west of us, so this is, uh, this is in Haver, Montana, which is directly in between uh, the Fort Belknap Reservation and Rocky Boy Reservation. So you got all these natives around you. You have Chippewa Cree on one side of you. You got Na Nakoda uh, Grovan on the other side. And uh, here's, here's this university. And guess who was teaching uh, American Indian Studies at this institution? that is, you know, only miles away from these two reservations. It was a guy from Finland that was teaching this, these, uh, teaching that class. Really kind of strange. Anyway, we won't talk about that anymore. Uh, how directly do you come to a point in a conversation, personal space, and facial expressions? And of course, if you look at this guy on the right and you say, he's not Indian, what are you talking about? Well, he is, uh, but he's not from the Southwest. He's actually uh, a, uh, a Sioux from uh, uh, Minnesota, Dakota, Dakota Sioux. Uh, the dominant culture in the United States, of course, is the white culture. Uh, about 70% of the population is white. Because of the dominance of the culture, whites tend to be given institutional benefits referred to as white privilege. And this is something that you have to understand, you have to recognize. Most of them do not. Um, there was an argument on uh, Fox News the other night. Uh, Tucker Carlson was arguing that there is no white privilege. And it was really kind of a cure. And Rush Limbaugh has argued the same thing. Well, there's no white privilege in the United States. You know, it, just stupid stuff. But the reality is, I recognize it. Most white Americans do. It's one of the reasons why Black Lives Matter is, uh, it has legs why it is taking traction in the United States, because most people actually recognize white privilege. 
you ask Donald Trump, potentially he would not admit it. But yeah, white privilege does exist. Whites often do not, that's Tucker Carlson on the right there, by the way. Uh, whites often do not recognize that they are privileged because it is the norm as far as they're concerned. Just like attractive people don't recognize that they are privileged, tall people don't recognize that they are privileged, athletes don't recognize that they are privileged. Really curious thing, if we look at uh, candidates for president of the United States, it's usually the tallest person that wins, as weird as that seems. And that's why I'm not president. No, that's why I'm not president. Anyway, so, you know, most people don't, don't realize that they get things that other people don't. Uh, I had a, um, let's see, how can I explain this? Uh, she was a girlfriend. It was in between wives, okay? Uh, she was a girlfriend. And she was very, really, really attractive. And we had this conversation about uh, attractive, and she was just really pretty. And this lady, people gave her stuff. Uh, people bent over backwards to help her. Why? Especially guys, of course, because she was gorgeous. Uh, anyway, she didn't recognize the fact that everybody didn't get the same thing. You know, us ugly short guys, you know, we recognize it because we're, we're not privileged, but uh, attractive and tall and Athletic. I've always been athletic to some extent, but uh, not in popular sports. Uh, I'm from Indiana, and uh, in Indiana, basketball is God, is a religion, <clears throat> and I ran track, of course. So, uh. <laughs> anyway, and if you go to college, you know football. You got to be a football hero to be attracted to a beautiful girl or something. I don't know. It's a song. Anyway, I was a track star. Uh, women and men are different. Uh, they respond differently to the same stimuli, and therefore they must be approached differently in therapy. Research shows that the male and the female brain are different. They really are. Male brain is larger. Female brain is smaller. Uh, male brain, uh, uh, males have penises. That's the, their, their sex is based on genitals. So your sex is whatever genitals you have. If you're a man and you, you have a penis, you're a woman, you are born with a vagina. Uh, of course, now we can change all that uh, if we need to. Uh, but uh, there, there's actually a difference in the brain, in the brain structure. And this has to do with testosterone. At this, during the sixth week, if you are a male, uh, then the, the male brain is bathed with this testosterone. And it actually changes the brain structures, as weird as that may seem. If you're a female, you don't, you're not, your brain isn't bathed with these, with this uh, male, uh, with the androgen, with the, the male uh, uh, hormone, and uh, your brain structure is different than than uh, female and the male brain are not exactly the same. One of the differences is male brain is larger, but that doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean a whole lot anyway. Uh, but the female brain has a larger corpus callosum. That's a connection between the two hemispheres. Uh, does it make a difference? Yeah, it does. It really does. Uh, one of the differences is that uh, most females have better language skills than most males. Uh, but of course, it's average, and you know we can find a male with really good language skills. We can find a female that stutters or words all the time. Uh, or stumbles over over sentences, you know, but it's more likely to happen to a male. If there is uh, almost all the mental illnesses are more prevalent in male, uh, males than it is than it is in females. Uh, autism is more common in males than females. So, uh, ADHD is more common in males than females. There is a difference between the male brain and the female brain. But sex isn't always a final word on gender. Gender is the social assignments of how males and females are supposed to act. Behavior is often based on gender stereotypes. Girls are nurses and boys are... This is an old picture, by the way. I, don't, I didn't make this up. <laughs> uh, boys are policemen and girls are meter maids. You know, it's from a, from a book from the 1950s, probably. When I was growing up. So, there you go. Uh, gender stereotypes prescribe how a person should respond to life. 
Unfortunately, social construction of gender continues throughout our lives. Gender bias uh, comes through the use of unexamined stereotypes. Uh, the good counselor will ignore stereotypes and allow their client to express feelings freely. Tell, they need to tell you who, who they are. Just because they don't have uh, breasts doesn't mean that they're, uh, they're a male. Uh, just because they have breasts doesn't mean that they're a female. Um, it doesn't mean that they have stereotypical ideas. A good example, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday we, called, uh, we called a tree service to come and, and take care of our trees. <clears throat> And the individual that came over was, was, was a female. Now, normally, you know, this is uh, uh, getting up in a bucket and, and sawing limbs off and whatnot. Well, you know, stereotypically, that should be a male job, not a female job. But here, this lady came over. Uh, she not only owns the truck with the bucket, but she's the one that does the sawing. Uh, the guy that, uh, that, she brought a guy with her, and he was the one that picked up the limbs and uh, chipped them. He was the one that put it in the chipper. Uh, and it's really kind of curious uh, that she uh, did, didn't fit, fit the stereotype. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that my wife called her. She, was, uh, she wanted to support this lady that, uh, that didn't fit the stereotype. Well, there's a lot of old farmers around here, and probably they're going, oh, I'm not going to call Tricia because, you know, she's, she's too butch for me or whatever. You know, and that's just not right. Anyway, uh, Tricia's going to take care of our trees uh, when she's, you know, she's got a lot of stuff to do, so she's going to take care of our trees. Thank goodness. Fifteen of them. One of them is completely on the ground. Uh, some people do not agree with uh, the sex that they are assigned by genetics. Uh, these individuals are referred to as transgender. If they have sex reassignment surgery, they become transsexual. Uh, these are the same people, uh, but uh, one of them is after uh, sexual reassignment surgery. And I don't remember if it's a male who became a female or a female that became a male. I don't remember. Anyway, it's the same person. And I don't remember the before and after. I do, can't remember which one's which. Uh, transgender and transsexualism has nothing to do with sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is the direction or directions of one's sexual, affectionate, or uh, loving attention. Embedded in sexual orientation or societal beliefs, stereotypes, and views about sexual expression. Coming out for homosexuals is complicated but has been made easier by the legalization of homosexual unions. Practitioners are not uh, immune to heterosexism. Uh, and, and of course, this can be a problem. I had a brother in law who was transgender, and uh, uh, I don't think he ever became transsexual. I don't know because uh, as soon as she, he was married to my sister and uh, she developed cancer and after she died we didn't have any contact with him anymore so we're not exactly sure what's going on with the, with her. Uh, she she is a female now. Um, uh, the state uh, <laughs> she was in Indiana and uh, the state agreed to identify her as female even though her birth gender was male and she had been married to a female. This is before, uh, before uh, gay marriages were allowed anyway. And we don't have any idea what her sexual orientation is, as curious as that is. Influence of socioeconomic status. Uh, socioeconomic status refers to standards and measurements of economic wealth and structures. Uh, socioeconomic status is especially efficacious in capitalist economies where wealth dictates your position in society. And of course, if we look at uh, the uh, uh, Trump administration, lots of billionaires in his administration. So that uh, wealth has dictated to him who he, well, these are his friends. These are the people he knows. And he doesn't know any of us poor, poor slobs. And of course, we are not part of his administration. Socioeconomic status is based on several measurements, income, occupation, and education. Socioeconomic status influences many aspects of your life. The quality of health care, you get better health care. 
Obesity is tied to socioeconomic status. The poorer you are, the more likely that you can't afford good food. Therefore, you eat as many calories as you can. And unfortunately, a lot of this is uh, not good for you. And they, be, they become relatively fat. These are two of the richest men in the United States. That's Bill Gates on the left. And that's, oh, geez, I just, uh, he's from Omaha. Uh, I can't think of his name. Anyway. Yeah, he's, he's one of the richest men. Looks like they're drinking Coke, doesn't it? Uh, educational possibilities. Of course, if you have lots of money, you can send your kid anywhere. You don't have to worry about them passing a test to get in. Neighborhoods that you can afford uh, to live in. Of course, most wealthy people live in gated communities, and you, get, you can get all the child care you want. Warren Buffett, that's who that is. That's Warren Buffett. Uh, child care, of course. Uh, you don't have to take care of your own kid. You can hire somebody to take care of your kid 24-7. Uh, it is important for practitioners to understand the invisible but powerful impact of socioeconomic status. The higher the socioeconomic status, the more likely a practitioner will assume success for their clients. Uh, so poor people, of course, the reason they're poor is their mental illness. No, that's not really true at all. Uh, but that's that's the way a lot of practitioners see things. Uh, the reality is uh, practitioners don't always go where the mental illness is. A lot of them, if we look at uh, if we look at uh, uh, Arizona, what we will see is that mo almost all the practitioners live in Phoenix and Tucson and Flagstaff. They don't live on the Navajo reservation. They don't live in Snowflake. They don't live in Sholo. Uh, they don't live in Holbrook. Uh, they live in, uh, in, the, in the wealthy places. And of course, if you have wealthy clientele, then you can charge them more money. Uh, if you have poor clientele, then you can't charge them very much money for your services. So unfortunately, there are a lot of greedy psychologists out there. And they're in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Cleveland, or they're Denver. Wherever there's a big city, that's where they are, because that's where the money is. Uh, for many clients, spiritual and religious beliefs and training are key to their existence. A wise practitioner will not question a client's spiritual or religious training. If somebody says they're Hindu, don't argue with them. If they say they're Mormon, uh, don't. Uh, they'll probably say, I'm a, I, I belong to the Church of Latter-day Saints, not Mormon. Uh, if they say that they uh, are, are from that uh, religion, you cannot argue with them. Uh, you know, that's their spiritual belief. If they say they're traditional, uh, but, you, but their ideas of what uh, Diné uh, traditionalism is, is different than yours, you can't argue with them. You can tell them what yours is, but you can't argue with them. Religion involves communal behaviors. Spirituality can be understood as an individual's relationship to God or any ultimate power. And you may be looking at this going, what the hell have you showed us? This is horrible. Uh, this, these, are, these individuals are Shiite Muslims. And they uh, will, on a certain day of the year, because they're, um, uh, the individual that they worship was martyred on that day, that's they, they will whip themselves and, and make themselves bleed, as you can see. And that's what's going on here. It has to do with their religion. And, of course, you can't argue with it. Don't whip yourself. You can't say that. Some religions are totalitarian in nature or don't accept uh, any other religious concept as legitimate but their own. Unfortunately, that's what happened with Christians when they first came to the New World, uh, to the Americas. Uh, they practiced a form of Christianity that was uh, totalitarian. They tried to force people to change their religion. They tried to take, to force all the indigenous people to change their religion. So this was especially true with the Spanish. Uh, they would not accept uh, individuals who were, uh, had not converted to Christianity. And sometimes they just killed the people that uh, did not agree with them or they couldn't convert. Other, other religions are relatively pluralist in nature and accept many practices as legitimate. And of course, hopefully that's the way it, it's going in the Middle East because otherwise these people kill each other. They start wars and kill each other. 
A practitioner must be aware that their own spirituality or religion might taint their view of a client. A practitioner must accept a client within their client's religious context, no matter what it is. As we age, we change going from infant to toddler, uh, to a child, to an adolescent, uh, a young adult, and then declining as an adult until we are no longer functional and we die. That is the life stages that we have. Life stages are influenced by our biological development. Eric Erickson identified eight life stages that occur in everyone's life tied to a psychological crisis that must take place for the individual to develop normally psychologically. And this was Erickson's idea. The first stage is hope. The first stage is at, uh, from birth to the uh, second year of life. The crisis that must be resolved in the first two years is trust versus mistrust. Will the caregiver be there when the infant needs food, sucre, or a change of clothing? <clears throat> That's the first stage of life. The second stage of life is potty training, and this teaches will. Somewhere in the second year, uh, it run and runs until the, the child is completely potty trained. That is the second stage of life. The crisis involved in the second stage is autonomy, Will I be able to go out in society without shaming myself, or will I not be able to? And of course, holding, being able to hold your urine and your feces is, uh, you will not be socially acceptable unless you can do that. So all children need to develop autonomy. Otherwise, they feel shame and doubt. The third life stage, purpose, uh, runs until the, the child starts school at age five. Uh, the crisis that the preschooler goes through is initiative versus guilt. Has the child been allowed to express their desire to discover the world on their own? And of course, this is this is the most fun stage of, of all. Uh, children are out there playing with leaves. They're out there digging holes. They're out there eating worms. Uh, it's always it's always a lot of fun. My favorite stage. Uh, the fourth life stage, competence, involves going to school and developing a whole new social interaction. The fourth crisis is in industry versus inferiority. Will the child strive to compete an, uh, on an equal level with their peers? And of course, this has to do with competition between a child and all the people that they grow up with. Industry versus inferiority. The fifth life stage, fidelity, encompasses adolescence and all the problems fraught from the, that transition. Uh, the crisis that Erickson identified at this point in life was identity versus role confusion. Who will I be as an adult? And we see uh, teenagers groping around for uh, their self-identity. This week they're athletes. Next week they're skateboarders. Uh, the week after that they're punks. Uh, you know, they, they, they keep experimenting with different looks with different ideas. Uh, this week they're wearing no makeup. Next week they're, they're putting on uh, goth uh, makeup. Uh, they're wearing only black clothes. Uh, drove, my, drove me crazy. I like color. Uh, my, son, my son went through this stage where all he wore was black, white, and gray. Uh, and I thought he'd never grow out of it. It just drove me nuts. Uh, because you couldn't buy him a a yellow shirt or you couldn't buy him a you know a green pair of pants it had to be black gray or actually what happened was uh, he started running cross country and after he uh, the <laughs> the school colors were blue and yellow uh, his the school that he, high school that he went to so uh, after that uh, he, of course he got a letter jacket uh, and he got a letter sweater so he started wearing those and it really changed who he was, he became a lot more popular, uh, and he he uh, drifted out of his gray gray and black face, as weird as that is. The sixth uh, life stage, love, occurs as a as a young adult. The crisis that Erickson identified at this point in life was intimacy versus isolation. Uh, will I pair bond and have children, or will I remain alone? And of course, this is something that everybody is continually asking themselves. There's all kinds of dating apps on, on, uh, on social media uh, trying to pair bond you with somebody that is compatible with you. Uh, in the old days, of course, you had to meet them. Uh, 
Uh, so it was it was a lot different in the in the past. The seventh life stage, care, involves uh, getting older, and it runs through the heart of the individual's working years to retirement. Uh, the crisis involved is generativity versus stagnation. The last life stage is wisdom. It deals with the individual's declining years, and it ends with their death. Uh, the crisis the individual faces at this stage in life involves a life well lived or a life wasted, and the crisis is integrity versus despair. What did I do in my life? Did I rip everybody off? Uh, did I you know, have have sex with the wrong people uh, too frequently? Uh, you know, was I a bad person or was I a good person? Different rates of physical development and social pressures influence life stage decisions. Some people may go through the life stages quickly because they were forced to support their family at an early age. Others may delay getting into adulthood because life situations have not forced them through identity versus identity confusion. And of course, this was happening when I was growing up. Um, the Vietnam War started in 1965. Well, I graduated from high school in 1967. You can talk to your grandparents about this and, and how influential the Vietnam War was, um, uh, they were drafting people into the, into the army. They were drafting people into the military uh, during the Vietnam War. So if you went to college, if you didn't go to college, then if you went to college, you got a 2S deferment. If you didn't go to college, you were a prime candidate for wandering off into the jungles of Vietnam and potentially dying over there. Uh, so, you know, this is this was uh, identity versus identity confusion. A lot of these kids were being drafted right out of high school. Well, when I was a, in 1969, they came up with the draft lottery uh, because what was happening before, only the poor kids were going into the military. The rich kids didn't have to go, only the poor kids went. But in, after 1969, they started drafting anybody and they gave everybody a number. Well, my number was 72 and it hit I graduated in June, and it had hit the previous May. So as soon as I and I had to, I had to go down and get my physical uh, before I uh, graduated from college. As soon as my draft number hit, I had to go down and and, and uh, uh, have a physical. So you know I had been able to to uh, dodge the draft uh, as a student for four years, but this was in 1971. <clears throat> So I, you know, I didn't have much choice. Uh, I had to go, and I went in in October. My brother, his draft number was one, and he graduated in. He graduated the same year that I did. Is that right? No, he graduated in '69. I graduated in '71. He he gra when he graduated, uh, his no draft number was one, and he graduated in in May. And by the end of June, he was in the military. And by October, he was in Vietnam. Uh, so here he was, an 18-year-old uh, kid. He, no, they didn't take him in until after he turned 18. He turned 18 in July. So they drafted him, or he went into the military almost right away. And by October, he was in Vietnam as an 18-year-old kid. So you can imagine growing up in the jungles of Vietnam. Oddly, during adolescence, everyone wants to fit in, but adulthood means establishing your own identity. And of course, if something truncates this, like uh, the Seth Rogen movies, uh, Seth Rogen is a big time, was a big time pot smoker. Uh, you know, anytime you you put something in your head, uh, or put something in your body like alcohol or marijuana, it it uh, arrests your development at that stage. Uh, if you smoke a lot of pot, you're the same age as you, your brain is the same age as it was when you first started smoking. And of course, that's what was going on with most of these Seth Rogen movies. They were all coming of age movies. Uh, I think he's changed now, but I'm not, I, I don't know. I haven't seen, he hasn't made a movie in a long time. Uh, oh, I apologize. Wait a second. The, the next slide has nudity in it. It has to do with, well... Anyway, you'll, you'll see that it's, it's not really pornographic. Practitioners help clients deal with challenges of life stages. Not everyone passes through or is allowed to pass through the life stages at the same rate. 
Some people are assisted through the, through the life stages by their parents or whatever. We're going to talk about this right now. Uh, family influences uh, our worldview. Uh, what we are told as children will temper the way that we deal with people outside the family all of our lives. Even the concept of family may be skewed by those who grow, that we grow up with. Um, my, family, <clears throat> my family takes care of, we make sure that uh, everybody's taken care of. We take care of our own, as it were. Uh, other families, you know, you turn 17 and, and you're out the door and, and you better be able to take care of yourself or your SOL. Anyway, so everybody, everybody deals with things differently. Families have their own ideas. Uh, my dad wanted to make sure that we all had houses before he died. Uh, so he left us all. He, his idea was he's going to leave it. He had, he had a million dollars worth of stock, and there were six of us. Well, one of us died before, before he did. So uh, that's about $200,000 $200, apiece. Uh, but he died after, he died after the 2008 recession hit. So his stock was only worth about half of what it was supposed to be worth. But that's still a hundred thousand dollars. You know, his idea was we all paid off, would all pay off our mortgages and we'd all have places to live. That was what he wanted for his children, houses. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it didn't work out that way. I have a house. I'm okay. Of course, it just got hit by a derecho. Understanding how we have been affected by our own family helps us recognize these experiences as personal and not assume the same meanings and experiences are true for others. One person may have had no support from their parents. Another individual might recognize cousins or, or anyone similar as brothers and sisters. And of course, my family was not that way. Uh, I, can, I don't even know some of my cousins. But, you know, you guys have this clan structure and, and, and all these people are supposed to help you, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, I, I, had, I had my dad and my mom, and that was about it. There are a number of groups of people who are re referred to as family amongst the traditional Diné. Uh, clans uh, dictate family and extended relationships. The white people, most white people don't have clans. The Scots do but uh, other people don't. Developmental stages for families are influenced by culture, religious, and spiritual beliefs, socioeconomic status, etc. Uh, as families develop in time, changes uh, in any of these statuses can cause changes in family dynamics. And of course, that's always, that's always interesting. Family has changed in, in recent decades. A divorce was once a social stigma, but now many people have multiple marriages and thus multiple families. Blended families have become the norm. I know I've been married three times, but I only had children in one of my marriages. So, uh, the, you know, that's, the kids are being raised by a stepmother, or were, they're in their 50s now. <laughs> my daughter will turn 50 in, no, she's already 50. She turned 50 last, last September. She'll be 51 uh, next month. Uh, my son's 48, so, uh, you know, talking about being raised is a little strange at this point. But, uh, yeah, we, we didn't really have a blended family. Uh, disabilities are a fact of life. With every ability we tout, there are those, including us, who may lack that ability. Uh, this isn't, isn't really a disability. I'm not saying it is. But I have a problem remembering lyrics, okay? Uh, I can't remember lyrics to songs. Now that's not going to, that's not going to kill me. It's just it m makes people laugh at me when I try to sing a song. Uh, but uh, I, I got in trouble because I couldn't remember lyrics. Once upon a time, and maybe I'll explain that to you later. Disabilities come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, some make life a struggle with others, uh, while others, like my lyrics phobia, uh, have very little impact at all. It is estimated that 20% of the people in the United States will experience a serious disability in their lifetime. And of course, not being able to remember lyrics is not a serious disability. Certainly, I'm not comparing myself with someone who is a quadriplegic or whatever. Developmental disabilities are severe and chronic. Uh, they are due to a mental or physical impairment. 
Uh, they manifest themselves before the age of 22. They are likely to continue indefinitely. They result in substantial functional limitations. They represent services and support for survival. In the past, many people with disabilities were isolated from the mainstream community. They were locked in people's attics. They were locked in people's uh, basements. They weren't allowed to, because they were socially embarrassing, uh, they were not allowed uh, in public. Um, John F. Kennedy had a, had a sister who was uh, bipolar, I think. Anyway, nobody talked about her, and at one point they locked her up in an asylum because she was becoming sexually active, and they didn't want her to get pregnant. So they locked her up in an asylum. This is the President of the United States, and they just locked his favorite sister in an asylum. And nobody talked about it. It was embarrassing to them, and they didn't want people to think, wow, if John's got a crazy sister, then maybe John's crazy too. This was a stigma in the 1950s and 1960s. <clears throat> so uh, that's what happened with John's sister. I can't remember. I think her name was Rose. Or his mother's name was Rose, too. I don't know. I can't remember what her name was. Anyway, eventually, she, and she stayed in an asylum the rest of her life so that people wouldn't know that there was insanity in the, in the Kennedy family. However, through legislation, people with disabilities are now afforded the opportunity to live lives as close to that of a non-disabled person as possible. There are legal protections for those with disabilities, Americans with Disabilities Act, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, the Rehabilitation Act, Affordable Health Care Choices Act. Language is, an important, is important when dealing with people with a disability. Words used in the past may have taken on stronger and stronger stigmas, Therefore, being politically correct when dealing with disabilities makes the stigma less intrusive. Uh, incorrect term is mailman. Uh, the uh, correct term is mail carrier. Uh, the incorrect term is midget or dwarf. Uh, the correct term is horizontally challenged. We don't call people blind anymore. We refer to them as visually challenged. We don't call people fat. We call them stout or overweight. We don't call them crippled. We call, call them disabled or physically challenged. Uh, another one that I get wrong almost every time is if somebody is slender. See, I said it right that time. You don't call them skinny. Uh, you, you refer to them as slender. And I make that mistake almost constantly. Uh, it is important for practitioners to take care of themselves as well, as well as their clients. They must be aware of possible stressors in their private life that can impact their lives. They must maintain a sense of perspective. Are they living vicariously through their clients? And of course, this will cause all kinds of problems. It will cause burnout. The practitioner is the instrument of therapy, and unless they are cared for and in tune, they will not be able to do their job. Focusing on others and ignoring your own needs can lead to burnout. Burnout is increasing discouragement and emotional and physical exhaustion. Burnout is not uncommon among practitioners. Building a healthy lifestyle is important and must be started immediately. Don't wait until you graduate and get into a groove uh, of a healthy lifestyle. The sooner you start, the more routine it will become. Eat well, eat good food, uh, exercise whenever possible. When a practitioner is working with a client, they will sometimes begin experiencing the emotional and physical pain of their clients. And this is known as secondary traumatic stress. And you can actually get PTSD from your client's problems because you are... You're, in, you're internalizing their problems, and you really shouldn't do that. There you go, the picture that we started with. It is important to work on developing character strengths such as creativity, love of learning, humility, and other qualities, and that will help you with your stress and demands. And that is the end of the chapter. And that's the end of the lecture for this week. I'm sorry it was so long. Oops. Oh, there it is. Okay, uh, this is uh, psych.
I need to 